Redwood is the California state tree, but I know when I think of California, I really think of oaks. Uh, maybe because we're in Southern California, so I don't see a redwood very often. <laughs> but, uh, you know, as you drive inland or through Santa Barbara, north of there, San Luis Obispo, on up, you know, California is really grasslands and oaks. That's what I think of. Um, so, uh, you know, the oak hasn't been uh, maybe a primary bonsai tree coming from Japan. But uh, in the 50s and 60s, it was really picked up from the activities in California and is now uh, a major contender amongst many other trees in terms of the bonsai subjects. Uh, today, we've got uh, Al Nelson, who's uh, come down from the uh, Irvine area, I think, Orange County, talk to us about oaks. Uh, one of our club members had met Al at one of the conventions and said, you know, this guy knows a lot about oaks. We really ought to get him down here and talk. So. Uh, managed to do that. Uh, I apologize to Al, but the most I know from him is from a quick uh, search on the internet. And uh, I'll mention that he's been a longtime member of the California Bonsai Sist uh, Society. Uh, he studied with uh, a lot of the great masters, uh, John Naka being one of those. And in fact, uh, one of the uh, maybe more famous oak bonsai trees, which is at the, uh, the U.S. National Arboretum, was a tree that I believe Al was with John, and they uh, harvest that out of the wild up in the Lompoc area. Maybe Al can add a little bit to that. So you look at the trees, the U.S. National Arboretum, uh, there's an oak that John has uh, actually harvested from the wild uh, with Al. Um, I believe Al has other interests other than, than oaks, as most of us do, but uh, I've seen some pictures of him with, uh, uh, let's see, I think it's uh, group plantings, and I also noticed that he teaches a class for making stands for a suseki, or viewing stones, and if you've ever seen those stands, they have to match the stone perfectly, so I always wonder how you get the, the wood to match the stone, so I may be asking him after this uh, session if he's still teaching that class. I'd, I'd like to learn those arts. Anyway, uh, without further ado, Al Nelson, come on up, Al. For those of you who work at the Safari Park, um, you've already seen it, but a few months ago, Al um, donated a magnificent oak tree to the Safari Park. Um, just the pot alone, the pot is like something like this. It's, it's huge. The tree, um, it's just fabulous. And uh, I'd like to give Al uh, an applause for his really terrific donation of a very <laughs> Right hand, left hand man, and a very good friend. He's going to help me out today. Okay, how many you could bring some of that up here? Anyway, we brought a lot of stuff to show you, and uh, I'm going to have uh, pass outs for everything we're going to talk about on my, my source, but uh, unfortunately for you, it's all in Orange County, but if you get up that way, there's some really great places to pick up uh, some supplies. So we're going to cover uh, 10 subjects, and we'll take questions after each subject. Is that okay, Bob, if we do it that way? Yeah. Okay, we're going to go through, uh, we're going to start right at the beginning with collecting. Then we're going to go on to soil mix, my soil mix. There was a gentleman in our club, Gary, he did a study on soil mixes, and he, and he surveyed about 40 bonsai people and he had 41 different bonsai soils because he concluded his. So no, none of us do it the same, but if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And then uh, propagating, repotting, styling, pest control, fertilizing, and fungus control, and then the sudden oak death, they call it SOD, and how to bring a distressed, distressed tree back to life. And as I said up here, we have uh, my source list. You know, I'll get it later. And I have about 40 of them. So this is this list tells you where you can get these items and what they are. So I've been collecting for about uh, 30 years. I had a very good friend 
that uh, had the keys to every gate on the Bixby Ranch up in Longpoke area. And the ranch is probably 20 miles long and about 10 miles wide. And his daughter and son-in-law were the managers of the ranch. So Vandenberg tried to, they're right next to Vandenberg, just south of them, and that property went right to the ocean. So Vandenberg tried to take it away from them uh, three times. They battled it twice, it cost them a quarter million dollars each time. And, and the third time they came after him, they said, no, we're, we're not going to uh, uh, fight it again. So they cut the ranch up into ranchettes and sold everything off so Vandenberg couldn't touch them. However, I could never get back in there, in there for oak trees. It's a wonderful place. So there's about 40 different species of oaks in California, but there's probably 150 or more subspecies, and because of oaks, it, they're, they're very promiscuous out there. They mess around with each other. So even with a, acorns off of one tree, you'll get varying species of the tree. So my favorites are the, uh, the live oak and the scrub oak. Now the best time for collecting is going to be from uh, November through February. The trees are kind of uh, sleeping at that time. So when you dig your little trench around the oak tree, or any other kind of tree for that matter. Uh, you want to differ a tree maybe four inches, you want uh, maybe a 14 inch diameter, and you want about maybe 10 inches down for training and getting it home. So uh, the first thing you do when you get it out of the ground is you wrap the roots, yeah, I do anyway, and wet, wet burlap that's been soaked in uh, HB 101 or Thrive, Super Thrive, something like that. And then you get it out of the ground with good roots and spray the roots with, uh, I use HB 101 or it could be the, the, the burlap seems to really work well for me. It's got that in it already. And then you wrap it with a roll of U-Haul uh, wrap or you could get it in any uh, big box store, I think. This works really nice. Have many, many of you been collecting? Nobody? No, I oh, okay. We can, we can skip that part. I have a California unicorn. <coughs> yeah, okay. This works really well for almost anything. And, uh, oh, then we spray the tree all over the place with cloud cover. Many of you are familiar with a cloud cover? Mm -hmm. Not too many. Yeah, no. Well, you should really look into it. It's a marvelous product after you finish your tree. And we'll get into that in a minute. If I don't skip the state of the script, I get skipping around. Then <clears throat> you, we spray the whole foliage with the cloud cover. And a really good thing to do is to put it in a plastic bag. Now this is one of those big contractor bags. And put the whole tree in there and seal the top. And that prevents the uh, moisture from evaporating in the tree. Keep you going, get me going. Oh, I should stop here. What Howie's doing is, well, he's a little, uh, he's pretty fast. But we're going to deleaf this tree. When I first got this tree, it didn't have anything on it. This was from uh, the Lompoc area. And he's picking all the leaves off. You can pull them off with your hands. Now, many of these oaks are all brought, uh, brought home. They didn't have any leaf on them. Some of them didn't have any branches, like this one didn't have a branch. And it was next to an old stump, and I thought, well, I'll throw it in. And that, it turned out pretty good, but it's about 25 years old. So when we were digging these oaks in, uh, on the ranch, we offered to replace them with a small one-gallon oak grown from acorns. And they said, no, we don't want any more in here. And then we called those scrub oaks, which they really weren't. These are live oaks. Because a full-grown oak tree uh, they had a big powwow up there with uh, Forest Service. Takes 500 gallons of water a day out of the soil. And they were usually in drought conditions. 
So they didn't want anything to suck the water out of the soil. So when you get it home, uh, you want to, I, I pot it up with uh, pumice and, and uh, potting soil in a very large um, container. Keep it really moist and the foliage, uh, it, it, you want to wet it with a solution of uh, HB 101 over the, the whole tree, uh, soil at home for once a week for a few months. That's the only way I got uh, scrub oaks to grow. I always would lose them. They'd last a year or two and then they'd go away. Okay, any questions about uh, yes, I digging? Do. Yes. When uh, you're digging up your tree, um, before you put it in the bag, are you cutting back some of the branches or are you defoliating uh, some of the... Um, the tree? Yeah, good question. How much you take off the yeah. tree? Are we, when we get it out of the ground, right. are we defoliating or cutting it back? Right. Well, we do cut it way back, it. and it's okay to leave a bunch of foliage on because you don't want to make a decision out there uh, what, where you're digging. All right. Yeah, so leave as much as you can, and you can think about it a year or two away. Okay. The yeah. strength of the oaks, is it in the foliage or is it in the roots? Um, no, it's not in the foliage, but it's it's, it's within the tree, the tree. and you can what they call the nursery people polar uh, uh, polar pruning. Really take, that's what we're doing here. We're taking everything off of it, and the tree's got so much strength, especially in the growing period. But we'll get into that a little later. Okay, one more question. Sure. How much of the roots are you keeping? Well, uh, yeah, if the roots you want to keep are. When you cut an oak tree and that comes to the soil level, it flares out with a nabari, and then it'll come in, and then the taproot goes down. Uh -huh. So the taproot goes down much deeper than the tree is tall, and then it sends lateral roots out. So if you go down about six inches or so, and there are no lateral roots, then you want to discard the area there and cover it back up with soil. And then you go back two, three years later, and they'll have roots there. But if it just has a tap root with no lateral roots, it's not going to make it. Okay. Yeah. That answered. Yes, that answered. Sorry. Yep. Yeah. What was the last step again that you said that you needed to do to keep it alive more than a year or two? The last step you were. Oh, oh. That what I what I did that I wasn't doing previously to keep uh, the scrub oaks alive, and I have a couple of beauties now. When, we go up with Harry in the gang to, to uh, dig. I would go for the oaks, and the rest of them are all looking for California, so I had a pretty nice pickings. <laughs> and the last thing, that, what I did that, that changed everything was in a water can, two, three drops of HB 101, and sprinkle it over the whole thing. Uh, constant, like, you know, sometimes on a hot day, I do it every day. And now they're 15 years old or so. What is HB101? Pardon me? What is HB101? Well, I really don't know. <laughs> Anybody here know? <laughs> it either makes me feel better or really works. <laughs> yeah. Howie, do you know what that is? It's squeezed, uh, what do you call them? Some sort of seeds that they squeezed in on. There's some over there. Anyway, my survival rate on uh, collecting has been in the high 90s. Yeah. 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 I'd like to repeat the question, but my memory's failing me. Yeah, anyway, he wants to know, if, as you said, John Naka put a small amount of HB 101. Yeah, yeah, right. the directions on the bottle are very good. Yeah, I, I'm, uh, the HB 101 distributor has been at several conventions, and I asked him, and he can't really tell me what it does, but I know it works. It's really good. <laughs> yeah. And uh, 
I asked him, well, what if you put more than a couple of drops? He says, it won't hurt a thing, but it won't help you at all. Yeah, so a couple of drops to a gallon uh, works really, really well. Now, can you uh, bare root them entirely when you do your first repotting, or should that be more gradual? Now, what do you mean by bare root? Well, you get rid of all the native soil from when you collected it? Oh, yes, yes. I failed to mention that. Yeah, you don't want to lift that out of that pot. Yeah. Good catch. But you want to wash everything out. Even You can even take the hose and put a medium spray and wash the soil. You want to get as much of that native soil out as possible. Because it's, uh, I think John used to call it poison in there. It's not good for it. Okay, we'll move over to repotting. Now, say you've got this guy going really good and you want to repot it. It needs to be happy for one thing. Okay, the time for repotting is the same thing as uh, November through February because the trees are like kind of resting at that time. And as long as the weather is good, if you have a hot spell in November, why wait till December? They like the cool weather. They just, uh, they're not deciduous or anything. Some oaks are, but these oaks, they hang out of their leaves all year. And when you repot it, an extra deep pot is extremely important. It's because of that taproot that went down, way down, and it was using more water than, than you would know. So after we cut down, maybe we have four or five inches, and we have some lateral roots, but you have to pour the water to it. When it but John would always uh, tell us that too, that oak trees really need water. Incidentally, that's what brought his tree back from uh, at Washington. It's been there 15 years, in and out of sick bay. And uh, once they started really letting them, uh, hitting it with the water, uh, it really perked up. Now, my trees, uh, the soil mix is so loose that the water's got to run right out of them because, as you know, they need air down in those roots as well. So I tried a lot of different soil mix. I think every two, two or three years I change around and do something else. So I used to use uh, silica sand, uh, poultry grit, Chinese akadama, which was really bad, Japanese akadama, uh, potting soil, dry mix, and a few other things. Now my soil is uh, made up of 20% washed pumice, 20% sifted medium akadama. And the thing about akadama, which is, uh, I'm told by many nursery people, that it, the other ingredients don't take uh, uh, nutrients in, like the akadama take liquid fertilizer in and then release it, where everything else just uh, hydrates. So that's a good. A good, a good, it's good stuff. Okay, and then 20% sifted perlite, and thanks to Fred, I don't see him right now much. Thank you, Fred, for putting me on to the uh, uh, perlite. I like it a lot. And then 20% small orchid bark. I, and it's in, I have samples of all of these things up here if you want to come take a look later. Then I use uh, 5% uh, approximate fit, sifting, sifted uh, potting soil, and 5% shredded New Zealand sphagnum moss. And I use a quarter inch screen and I just rub it through there. Then I add some worm castings. And then I, for the larger oaks, I'll put in some jumbo, almost marble size akadama. So I want it, when I water, I want it to go right through, right out, good drainage. If you see any water pooling up anywhere else, you're in trouble. You've got to get that uh, repotted. Then I use on the bottom, see, we're going to take this tree, we've got the soil washed off, and we're going to repot it in a large pot. I actually, for the first year, would put it in a pretty good sized pot so that it's got a time to really get going and get real happy. So I put a, a layer of and I have this up here. I like this a lot. This is the expanded clay, and they expand it, I don't know how. And this I get at the marijuana stores, you know, the hydroponic places. 
they really, those guys really know how to grow things. <laughs> or I, I like the, the uh, for Big Tree, uh, the lava rock at the Home Depot or Lowe's, it's a pretty good size, maybe three-fourths of an inch. And I like that a lot too. Then, okay, we're going to pot it up, so you want to use rooting hormone. I get this rooting hormone at uh, Orange County Farm Supply, but it's, uh, what is it, yeah, so, 0.3% rooting hormone. And the regular rooting hormone you get at the uh, nurseries is 1%, 0.1. So this is three times as powerful. Anner was the one who told me about that. So then you, uh, you have uh, tie downs in there and wire, uh, wire tie downs and also screen across. Now, for those of you using plastic screen, I don't want to offend you, but I hate that stuff. I use uh, the galvanized screen. With a plastic screen, you, you lose about 30% of the drainage overall. I know it's nice, you can sometimes just tear it and stick it in there. And I've been told by some of my buddies that like the plastic stuff that this will rust out. Well, this will rust out in about 15 years. So if you've got rusting on it, you, you're probably going to have a very unhealthy tree. Now, the uh, Akadam, I was a little worried about it at first because I know it'll get mushy and they say it goes to concrete and all this kind of stuff. So I put a small amount in and I noticed a big change in the trees. Then when I repot them the next time, the roots are really going for it and they're kind of grabbing onto them. So when you pour the uh, soil mix in, I know I was taught with, uh, with the soil mix, you, you go in there and you, you poke it down in the pot and then you wiggle, 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 wiggle like this. And what I found when you're wiggling like that, you're smashing up, you're pulverizing some of your soil mix, especially Akadama. So what I've been doing for many years, I just do a straight poke and just a straight poke around. And then when you have it about half full to the uh, pot, then I water that in and I'd bring it all the way up and, and do some more straight ends and then uh, cover it with, after you tie it down of course, and then I cover it with a sphagnum moss, New Zealand sphagnum moss. I have a sample of it up here. And I, I got that, I get that, uh, well I was getting at this marijuana store, but I guess when they legalized marijuana maybe they went out of business out on uh, Riverside. So you can get it at the, on the internet. It's kind of pricey, it comes in a bale. I use a lot of it. I use it in the soil, sift it, and on top of the soil, just the way it is, it comes in long strands, about three, four inches long. And the New Zealand sphagnum moss, I'm told by many people, especially in the nursery and, and the hydroponic stores, that's a nice name for marijuana, marijuana stores. The, the, the New Zealand, is, is different than any other kind of moss. It has uh, nutrients in it. It has uh, all kinds of uh, oncobionics. It has antibodies. It has uh, just lots of good things. And also, when you cover the uh, when you cover the top with bag of moss, it, it if it dries out on a hot sunny day, as soon as the water touches it, it, boom, it hydrates instantly. Where in the other kind of mosses, they'll actually dry up and make a barrier. If you water it, they might run off. I know Kenji, uh, in Japan, they put sphagnum moss on top quite a bit. And the Kenji uses that as well. Kenji Miyata, you all know him. Some of you. Well, anyway, he puts it just around the trunk, but I just lay it on the whole tree because you have to learn to share it with the birds when they're making nests. <laughs> they really like it. Okay, so then we spray the whole thing uh, with uh, HB 101, and then we use this uh, cloud cover on top. The cloud cover is just like making a cloudy day in the bright sun, too, the, and it doesn't harm the tree whatsoever. In fact, it even kind of makes it just a little bit of a sheen to it, so you could put it on prior to a 
show if you want your leaves to get perky. Okay, I think that's it for repotting. Any questions? Yes. Yeah. Do you put the large pumice in the bottom? Mm -hmm. Or are you putting it throughout the Oh, I'm sorry. Did I put the large pumice on the bottom? I wasn't very clear on that. I mix it with my soil. I have this soil that I told you about, the percentages. And I make that in about 40 gallon drums a couple at a time. I have student apprentices, they're kind of my slaves in the morning. So they go out there and mix it all together. And I put it in these big root cans with a lid. So that's my basic mix. And then I amend that, that uh, mix for oak trees. And if it's a, a large oak tree, maybe even the size of this one, just a little bigger, I'll use this. I have samples up here, you can see large size Akadama. And I found here, as far as getting Akadama, there's, well, I have it on the source list. But uh, Dave and June have some really good stuff now. Yeah. Yes, sir. Are you going to talk about this cloud cover a little bit more, or tell us where to get it, or where, what is it? Yeah, I have a source list here where you can get it. Um, you can get it at any nursery. They, they have it, but they usually have it in a ready, uh, ready to go, and it's kind of expensive that way. I buy this at I've seen it in some places, like Armstrong's, I think, has it in the concentrate. So you mix it 10 to 1, 10 of the concentrated and then 10 parts water. And I do that, but I buy it by the gallon. I have a lot of trees. I, I see and it's, you, can get a, uh, you can get a one quart concentrate for $16 at Walmart. Oh. Yeah, that's a good price. Yeah. yeah. But it's amazing stuff, it really is. Yes? With the HB 101, do you still? Thrive on the roots. I, I used to use Super Thrive before HB 101 came on the scene. Yeah, but on the roots. Um, well, I sprinkled rooting hormone on the roots. But as far as HB or Super Thrive, they're probably close to doing the same thing. But then when I get the, get it all potted up and put the uh, sphagnum moss on there, oh, yeah, then I water it with a, a gallon. This tree, I probably water the whole thing with the whole gallon, with uh, HB 101, or you could use Super Thrive if you don't want that. Yeah. <coughs> Any more on uh, repotting? Okay. Now we're going to go into fertilizing. Now, any of you familiar with a Siphonex is? You use yours, John? Not so much anymore. Oh. I used to, but I, I don't. Yeah, I really like it. The Siphonex will take a, uh, you put your chemical in there and it, 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 it squirts it out of the hose and put it in a bucket. And then, then the tube goes in the bucket. And then it, it goes into the hose line. It comes with this fitting and that fitting. It costs about $15 at most any nursery. Because I have so many trees, I have about 200 trees. And I, I want to, I, I fertilize them all at the same time. And I use a lot of liquid fertilizers. I like uh, muracid, miracle Girl. Most of my, uh, well, the oaks just love the acid. So I use the muracid, miracle Girl and seaweed extract. That stuff's amazing. Have any of you tried that? That's great, isn't it? And you see results in about 10 days, two weeks, everything is nice and green. And fish emulsion. There's some, uh, well, this Orange County Farm Supply, they have a mix. It's uh, seaweed extract and fish emulsion all together in one gallon, but I just buy them separate and mix them. So you, I mix this and this, or I might use uh, muracid, and I'll use some phosphite, which we'll come to later. And I'll even put some HB 101 in there, maybe a tablespoonful. There I was buying HB 101 by the pint. It was pretty big, and it was in the sunshine, so one day I knocked it over. It was about three-fourths full, and then it hit my patio, and it just broke like glass. <laughs> it went away. That much is kind of expensive, about $85. But there's a lot of vendors that have uh, HB 101. Okay, and what Howie's doing here, he's moving right along. We'll get into that a little later. 
Now every uh, spring, I use, uh, Lindsay Shiva put me onto this, it's ammonium phosphate. And it's a 16-20-0, but it has 13% sulfur. And you talk about perking up, and when they're kind of a little sleepy, and they're rubbing their eyes, and you give them this, boy, they come right away. Then every spring and late summer, I'll use this uh, phosphite. Let's see, I'm getting ahead of myself. Yeah, I'm going to tell you about phosphite in a minute. And then the Green King's a nice one too. I like that. I uh, put it on uh, a couple of times a year. And also like uh, uh, rape seed pellets. Now, it comes from the rape plant and it's grown mostly in, in Canada. And the, um, they make this uh, oil, they make rape oil, but they label it in the supermarkets. You may have heard it's called canola oil because the rape oil sounds really bad. <laughs> so they, um, uh, you can get, it's from Japan. I get it from uh, Gary Ishii at uh, Chico Inn. And it comes in a big uh, container. And they're pretty good sized pellets and just put them around. But then I found out that the squirrels like them better than I do, or the tree does. So what Gary uh, has taken to, he goes to the uh, Goodwill Salvation Army, and he buys an old blender. And he smashes them with a hammer first, and then he puts it in the blender and makes a powder of it. And then he sprinkles that all on his tree. Okay. And he, uh, okay, he also uses, uh, he put me onto it, really good stuff. How he passed that uh, blue one over, which please. What he's doing is taking this, and when you get the chance, you're going to come up and see this. Taking every leaf off very carefully. Okay, this is Bayer tree and shrub, last 12 months. And this is the, the, the uh, little uh, pellets, not the, it comes with liquid also. But we don't use the liquid for bonsai. The, uh, what it does, it lasts on a bonsai, it's a systemic, and it come up there and uh, it works wonders. I have a whole bunch of uh, banyan trees and they get thrips. You know, the leaf will curl up on you. And my, I have a lot of buddies in Hawaii and they've started doing this too because they, they grow wild there and this really takes care of the thrips that are gone. But this lasts about six months because you're leaching it through every time we water. And I water daily, I don't know about the rest of it. That is two and one, three and one. Two and one or three and one. Three and one. Oh, this? Yeah, this is uh, made by Bayer, which used to be the Aspen Company, but the Germans bought it out. It's uh, a tree and show up 12 months, the last 12 months. Is that what you wanted to know? Is it fungicide and insecticide? Or is it also fungi it, 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 yeah, it's a systemic and it kills insects, preserves new infestations, pro provides slow release. But it's faster release uh, with uh, our, our watering system. In fact, the, uh, well, I'm going to wait. I'm going to get into that in a minute. Does it, uh, does it help with the oak or? Does it help with the old ore? Yeah, I'm going to get into that later, but I'm not sure. But I'm sure how to get rid of SOD, or not get rid of it, but to print, prevent it, to prevent it. That's it. Yeah, he asked about the old ore, but I don't know. They say, I heard about it, and it's very, very tiny, and it goes into the tree and kills it from the inside out. That's a brand new one, and it's really uh, killing a lot of trees. Okay, we're about done with uh, fertilizing. Any other questions? Okay, now we're going to go into styling. Now, folks have uh, unique, a unique style all their own. They, there's no rules, there's no guidelines, there's no nothing. If you see an oak in nature, you see how they're, they'll have a monster branch up top, a little branch down here, they go down, and they, they do all kinds of things so that the, the uh, guidelines don't apply. 
I've seen oaks that are really so ugly. They, they come up with reverse taper and they're all chewed up on one side and there's a branch over here and all is dead branches over here and they're, they're so ugly they're just beautiful because that's what happens to them in nature. Before I even got into bonsai I was in uh, sales and I, my territory was Santa Barbara, uh, Lompo, San Luis Obispo and after I got through my sales I, I went out I took a camera no such thing as digital back then and black and white film because it was cheap and I'd take all the side rows and I'd take pictures of oak. I probably have a thousand pictures of them, but they're really inspiring. And it's my favorite tree. Just good stuff. See, the, some branches go straight down, as do oaks in nature, and the branches uh, stop and start every year. So if I try to uh, simulate that, a full-grown oak, it's going to grow, let's uh, say, uh, even a secondary branch or primary branch that go out here and they'll stop growing. If they go to sleep, that's this uh, uh, live oak. Then they just rest until early spring. And then they take off again, they go differently. That's how they get all that crooked stuff to them. And that's the beauty of it. That's what I want. Well, this method that I use is uh, very, very effective. But it takes a while. If you wire an oak, well, you're, uh, it could be trouble. I know for for sure about that. Mm -hmm. Why is it trouble? Uh, if you uh, wire an oak and you want to wire uh, wire loosely, and you get a little bit of wire bite, you got to really stay on it. And these are fast growers. Uh, I, I measured, and I have a pretty big oak that I just defoliated about a month ago, and then it took me 10 days working every day for a few hours to get it uh, pruned like I will do with this one. You can see all the ramifications that's come along here. We can come up and take a look. And what was the question? I got ahead of myself. Why wire? I, I don't want to wire. <clears throat> I do the directional pruning, but if you wire, you're going to get quicker results. There's a lot of people that like to wire. And another disadvantage of wiring is you don't get sharp turns. You get these S turns. And you don't see many oaks like that. I mean, they'll kind of have a little S at the tip, but then they'll go straight. And I have an oak that I wired up early on. Because I learned this the hard way since uh, the early 80s. And I wired up, and it's still got the wire bite on it. It's just a little discoloration. And it's still there. If it was a cork oak, I might cork over and you'd be okay, but I don't recommend wiring. I'm going to get into other, other ways to do it as well in a few minutes. Now, if you have an oak that, that, uh, that the branch is kind of running out and it's straight, and you start your zigzaggies out there, it's, it's not in, uh, it's just not compatible with the rest of the tree. So what you want to do is, is come early in and put some crooks in it as this one is and start that directional pruning there. But this tree will take probably 10, 15 years before it could be showtime. This has never been an exhibit. Anyway, wiring is uh, bad news for oaks as far as I'm concerned. There's a gentleman up in Northern California, uh, I think his name is JT, John Thompson, is that the guy? Yeah, and he wires oaks, and he's really good at it, and he's got magnificent oaks, because the beauty in an oak tree is the foliage. It's just spectacular. So that would hide a lot of that uh, wire biting. Now the oak at Safari Park is not a real good example of doing that. I sold it to a friend of mine 20 years ago and he got sick. He was kind of out of commission and he potted that oak in 100% Akadama. And I can guarantee you're going to have problems if you do that. You're going to have to repot probably every year for 18 months, two years at the, at the most. And they just don't like 100% Akadama. But he did that, and then I got it back. He passed away, and I got it back at his estate sale. 
I paid twice as much for it as I uh, sold it to him for. But he had repotted that uh, oak in maybe six or eight years or more. And Howie and I, remember that one, Howie? Yeah. That was an absolute killer. It took us about four to five hours to chisel the concrete out of there. That's the reason I stayed away from Hakadama for so long. And then I started trying a little bit at a time. And I noticed the difference. In, and it doesn't get that way if you repot at the proper times. But it was really in poor health. Not so good. Okay. We talked about directional pruning. Now they have a lot, a lot of bar branches, as you'll see with this one, which we take uh, advantage of. Okay. The branch is, see we got some nice movement here and here, and then this branch is going straight down. Can you all see that? That's the branch here. And this goes here. Now it's got a uh, bar branch on it. Lots of them, they do this. Does everybody know what a bar branch is? Opposite side. No, you don't. How many would you explain bar branch? It's a bar branch. <laughs> or it could be this way. No, or this way. Cork bark, absolutely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think cork over pretty, pretty good. So you got this bar branch. I'm trying to draw big so you can see it. So what in the world are we going to do with that? We want to get all these crooks and things. So the ideal thing, and I do this a lot, the ideal thing would be, so you got this crook, and this is moving this way, and not, it's going zig, zig, but you don't want to go in the same direction, you get a C shape. And I know most of you have read John's book, so C shapes, stink, uh, L shapes, uh, U shapes, and all that kind of stuff. They're not attractive. So the best thing to do would be to have this come out here. So what I do, I take it off here. And when you cut things off an oak, you want to leave a little nut, eighth to a quarter of an inch. It'll die back and it'll help make a sharper turn because it's got room to get fat. But I, uh, I'll get to that in a minute. Then I would take this guy off and use that as a secondary branch. And then that'll put out little buds. I'll probably leave a little longer. So you got here, 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 and over here. And then it might give you these guys again. So what would you do then? Okay. Take the middle guy out, go with this one, and shorten this one for a secondary branch. It makes you think, but it really works well, really good. And you can come and see this as an example. Any questions on that? And how we explain our branch. Good job, boy. <laughs> Straight up. <laughs> out. Yeah. Uh, when you're developing at that stage, um, do you do anything to make sure that your new branches have short enough inner, inner nodes to work with to get the zigzags? I know sometimes they just take off the first inner node would be beyond where I would even want to have it. Exactly, yeah. Um, I think I'm going to get into that here, yeah. So I'll do it now. The question was, uh, what was your question again? <laughs> short inner nodes. Yeah, sh short inner nodes. So where did where did it take them off? Well, if, if as I put in the picture there, the branches will get will move out, and if one of them gets away from you, you want to take it back to the first or second bud, and you can tell the buds on it. All you have to do is rub the branch, and everywhere you see a little bump, that guy's going to put a branch up. That didn't answer the question. Now are you saying, say this guy's running out to here? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, if it's growing so fast that the first bud is even farther than you would want. Am I over fertilizing or? You're talking about the primary branch? 
It's too long? Yeah, too long before you get to the first bud. Okay, so you got Well, you're going to have buds here and here and all over the place, that bar and like this. It'll have a lot of leaves, and, and everywhere there's a leaf, it's going to turn into a branch. What I think he's saying is that his first bud is not near the, the, the branch. It's actually way further down. Oh, oh okay. So he's talking about here, and he gets a branch that runs like crazy on him. But it's yeah. way out there. Way out here. It's got leaves on it all over the place, right? Yeah. Okay, and they'll have a leaf in here too, right? No. What? No. No, no leaf? Mm, I haven't seen one of those. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's going to go that far with no leaves. Okay, I'll tell you what to do in a minute. How to get, how to get buds in there and guaranteed to work. That's a really good question. Okay. Okay, stay away from wire if you possible. If you got a wire, go for it. Now, instead of wiring, uh, we're going to come back to your question here. Instead of wiring, I just use chopsticks for poking and guy wires, you know, with a little tube on them to pull things down. This, this method works really, really good. So you get this, this chain at any hardware store, and with a, top, a pot like this, most of our pots have this little powder lip roll, and you put this around the lip of the pot. And I, I have to make a few little uh, scrap wire holes for it, about every four inches, otherwise it wants to go down. Then you can, and, uh, you can put a little piece of tubing, any hardware, and you bend it over and send tie-down wire through there. A copper tie-down wire works better than uh, aluminum. It's a lot stronger. So if I wanted this branch over here down, I would put, after the chain is around there, then you just grab the chain with your guy wire and you put your protected wire in the plastic around the branch and you pull it down to where you want it. Now you can work it down, say a quarter of an inch in a month or two, and then you can keep bringing it down, down, and down. But oak trees don't, don't necessarily, you don't want to prune them like a pine tree. <clears throat> I know my buddies over in Hawaii, they have all the trees that go wild. They planted them for the, uh, for the uh, deer. They, they brought deer into Hawaii and the deer didn't have anything to eat, so they planted the, the, uh, the, all these olive trees. This is way back. And now the olive trees have taken off so bad, they're trying to get rid of them. And some of them are really magnificent. But they prune them, most of them guys do, they prune them in a pine tree. They want it like it had snow on it. Where an oak, it wants to come up. And as you know, deciduous trees do too. So you kind of got to, go with the, the way they grow in nature. Now, some of these branches I have are going on 45 degree angle down. And to me, that looks really great. So when I, when I go in and prune this, uh, I'll, I'll watch it uh, very carefully so that I might get an up, up and then some down this way. And not just on a vertical plane. You know, you don't want it this way. You want this to come up here and then go a little sideways work it every which way. But this works really good. So use that and then if I have to lift a branch, I'll put a I'll cut a chopstick and put it in here and lift that up. Fish weight. Yeah, like I'm looking for. Yeah. Well I'll just have to tell them about it. I had my sample. Anyway you know what a fish weight looks like and you can probably still get some lead ones, although like an even wheel weights on your car, they can't put lead weights on them anymore. They have to be zinc or something like that. For, we don't want to contaminate California. But on a smaller branch, if I want to move it, I have these fish weights, I make a little hook. And I'll just hang that weight on the hook. And if it's not enough weight, I'll put another one on. And you can even make the wires long to bring it down. Or you bring the guy wires down. Or you, if you have a gin somewhere and you want to pull this branch over, 
just use the plastic tubing and uh, bring it together where you want it. They take a set in just only a few months, they'll stay put. And when I put my wire on, oh, a lot of people like to put the wire up like this, come around here, and then put the twisty thing in there and do like so. I don't like to do that, I just do a wonder. Uh, I'll put a wrap around, say, the chain, and one wrap up here, but up here, then as I pull it down, I get a feel of it, so I don't over torque it. And then if I want to bring it down some more, just unwrap the wire and bring it down some more. Works really good. Then uh, gin, these guys give you a lot of gin. And if it's underneath another branch, it'll die on you. If they want some sunshine, because they keep all of them in uh, full sun, unless, it, and we'll get into that later. So <clears throat> they'll also send out, uh, John, you saw one at my place because you had your choice of trees. And this one that I have, very, really nice. And it's in a John Naka beautiful pot. And some of the branches on the back just went away. They just died. And that, that's kind of, uh, that's just their nature. They do that. Uh, even that big boy, you know, the John is 20 inches at the base, four feet high. And I just recently defoliated everything, and I had branches that were uh, dying off inside, and that made me a little nervous. So we defoliated it, like how he's doing here. I took my students, there were three of no, four of them, and took them over three hours to pull the leaves off this thing. And then it took me many, many more to, to uh, just make the ramification go in there and get them going the way I wanted. So the branches will just go away on you for no apparent reason. But they're pretty hard to kill. You've got to do a lot of bad things <laughs> for them to die. So the, on gin, uh, I don't know if you've heard. Anyway, this uh, it's called Minwax Wood Hardener. It's sold in almost every hardware store, the big box stores. It comes in a little uh, point thing, yellow can. And you can paint the uh, paint that on your gin, and you can also use uh, uh, lime sulfur. And I've tried mixing them. I put some of the lime sulfur and some of the mint uh, uh, wood hardener. Mix them up. It makes a beautiful color. Yeah, I like it a lot. So you need to you need to. Uh, applies a sealer. I like the Japanese sealers because they have all kinds of good chemicals and uh, help the immune system and the, uh, they got hormones and all that kind of stuff. Plus, I think what I like best about it is you put it on and five minutes later you could water the, the branch and it won't go away, like some of that black tar stuff. But you want to paint every, every wound you make that's a uh, little end of chopstick size or larger. You know, paint them, you want to seal them. And then when you also, did I mention, yeah, you want to leave a little nub when you cut a branch off and your secondary branch is coming this way, you want to leave an eighth inch or quarter inch nubber on there. Another thing you can do is you can take this rooting hormone and if your uh, sealer is kind of a liquid, you put on with a brush, you can mix the rooting hormone in there. I'm told by nursery people that the rooting hormone actually causes a callus to form. I have a styling question. A styling question, okay. yes. I noticed that uh, the live costumes are a, they're a pickle growers. So how do you get those bottom branches to thicken up as much as the top branches? Well, that's a good question. How do you get a branch to thicken up uh, as much as the top branches? Well, they play catch up. And they grow, I've measured how much an oak will grow, a half inch a day when it's really going. You can almost hear them grow. <laughs> okay, see this is uh, coming down here, and, and it's got, say it's got these bar branches on here. And we want this to go this way. Can everybody see this? And her question was, how do you thicken this, this up? Is that correct? That's correct. How do you get primary, that fat? The primary branch, how do you thicken Here's it? how you do it. Okay. You let that sucker. So you can keep this, you just let it run. That's what I've been doing. 
Are you I doing good? It works, doesn't it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's two and a half feet now. Well, if you if you do this constantly, once or twice a year, defoliate, yes. and you can see what you're doing. Get the dead wood out. There's there's gin to be made. That's great. But if you're the only way you'll get this is if this guy has ruined for a long time, then it gets fat. Okay, so I let it just grow uh, for one whole year, let's say? Well, I, yeah, I wouldn't let them grow a year. Okay. Because mm -hmm, they're so fast. I know. Yeah, they'll I, put out a, a shoot up here right. about six inches long in a couple of weeks. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I noticed that but the top roots, those branches are growing a lot faster, thicker than the bottom ones. The top root? Uh, yes. The foliage, the top foliage? The, yeah, those, those top branches. You can tell on your tree that your top branches are as thick mm -hmm. as some of those lower ones. That sort of bothers you. Yeah, they're kind of top top happy yeah, growers. They're top happy. Like a pomegranate, you want to watch it, they're not. Exactly. Yeah, the pomegranate, you. you Prune it not too much, it's going to go bye bye for you. Hmm. I'm sure if that answered the question, or maybe we'll get to it. Anyway, don't let them get that long. That's the key to it. Okay, all right. Yeah. And uh, you can defoliate twice, and then you can see what's going on, like this one. And then everywhere he takes a leaf off, why there's a little bud. Right. Yeah, so that bud's going to go that way and be the be the new branch. And then you don't want to let that go for more than maybe a month or two before you get after it. Okay. So why do you defoliate? Why do you defoliate? Because you can go in there, you can see what you're doing. The, uh, you can do the directional pruning. Uh, you can find the dead wood. How long does it take? For and the biggest thing about defoliating is like on this big one that I had defoliated and I was showing my wife the other day. It, it was just jam packed with leaves and it had been uh, by me a little neglected. I hadn't done it for about a year. So they took all the leaves off and when I finished uh, directional pruning, that tree's got new stuff on it like you never thought before. There were some things in there that I was convinced was dead, but I thought I'll leave it alone. It's, in, it's got uh, leaves out on that one now. And it'll send out a shoot from the trunk, and everywhere you can feel a little branch, there's a bump about every half inch or so, and that's a, a, new, a new branch that's coming. Are the new leaves going to be smaller? Sometimes. If you get it right in the sunshine afterwards, they'll get smaller. Yeah. But I've been feeding this guy, and that leaves are a little on the big side, but it's such a huge tree it can handle the big leaves. Yeah. Yeah. When do you defoliate? When do you defoliate? Uh, Any time from April through uh, August. No, September is good. It, it needs to be in a growing cycle when you do that because it has to have time to push out new leaves. So I just uh, defoliated. Well, this is going to be the last one I'm going to do this year. And this is going to have new leaves on it in about uh, seven to ten days. It'll be popping out all over. Time zone. Anybody got the time zone? Okay. It won't just it won't just grow leaves. It'll send out shoots, won't it? Yeah, it will. It, and, and yeah, shoot, it'll send out a branch there. Right. Mm -hmm. And when and how and how far do you pinch off that branch? When you defoliate? No, when it grows, it starts growing out. Oh, you just let it grow. You can still see in there because the leaves... I mean, they'll see them out that long. Well, I, I wouldn't let them get that long. Yeah. Then when you're... You see, you're going to have a long branch. Like this lady was talking about. This branch gets really long here. But it's going to have buds all over the place. So I go back to the first... The, this would be the... Uh, Okay, first bud, second bud, and maybe a bar branch across here. So if this is, say, a bar branch, you could go, since this comes this way, this way, and we're going to go over here, not here. Then I would go back to this bud over here, 
And as, as the longer the uh, branch grows, the further apart the buds are going to be. You probably noticed that. If something runs, well, at the bottom, the branching will be fairly narrow. And you get to the top, they get real wide. But that's another reason you don't want to let it get, uh, get away from you. So I would prune back to this. I take it off here, seal it real well. And this leaf, if it had a leaf here, I'd pick it off with my fingernail. And so you got here, here. Oh, wait a minute, I get all mixed up. Yeah, okay. This guy is over here. So you got all these buds in here, these little buds. Now every, on top of every bud, I mean leaf, these are leaves, when we de defoliate, see the leaf was down here. And the leaf was down here. So the buds are just above. You can come and see this one. They're, they're just above it. So if I prune to one of these out here, and say I wanted it to go this way, now I got short, 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 and pretty long here. So I, I would go back and I'd cut it off here. And let it come down this way. So I get the zigzaggies. So you don't need to wait a long time, just uh, trying to keep it when it gets to that size. But if you let it run and run, it's not so good. And then also you have a, if you have a tree here and your branching goes like this, and it's running way out there, and say, I, I want to do directional pruning on there. So you got a bud here, and you start it way out here, and it has a branch here. And you're going to go here, and you're going to go here. This is not in harmony with the rest of the tree. So it's what I call bite the bullet. If you had a tree that has just gotten away from you, or you acquire one, and you want to have it really look good, then you're going to, this is first bud, second bud, the bar branch, like that. I cut it back to here. That's biting the bullet. So you just uh, you want to start it closer to the trunk. Then this guy is going to go out here, okay. or you could even cut it here and have this first bud come out. But that depends how much room you have in here. So I just want everything in harmony and proportion. Then after, yes. okay. How we can show what a bar branch? Yeah. <laughs> Boy, you do good. Good work. Now what, uh, what Howie's doing here is every time we mess around with a tree, he's scratching about mm, a half to um, at least a half inch off the top because we're not going to repop this one. You can cut, yeah, yeah, and it, yeah. it's got tie down wires on it. So he's going to cut the, the tie down wires and just cut them to the top of the soil. Then he's scratching with this back scratcher here on the top of the soil and removing it. Then we're going to put some of our regular soil mix back on that, and then we're going to put sphagnum moss on top of that. And if you want to perk a tree up, uh, you can do it that way. It really works well. And I, got, I found out uh, the gentleman I got that from was uh, Mitsuya up in Northern California, and he does that to his. And so I started doing it, man, it makes a difference, really good. Is that in any kind of trees or just oaks? No, any kind of tree. <coughs> if, in oaks, if you put, if, if the sphagnum moss stays on a long time, the roots will start coming right up into that with almost any kind of tree. But that night, they didn't, the roots just don't go down, you know, they'll come up if it's got something <coughs> juicy that it wants to eat. I started uh, doing this because I have so many trees. I used to tie those little aluminum tags on there when I got it, what kind of soil mix, when I last repotted it, and then they, they push out and they get really good looking. I have all these aluminum tags hanging down. So how can I go in there? I gotta read every one of them. So I started putting uh, colored tags, these little ribbons, on each tree, and I have a code as to which year this is. So I can just look around and it's like, mm, that one's ready for repotting, I think. And if you're not sure, you, do you all know about the chopstick poke? Yeah, if it's pretty hard, 
Uh, you just want to poke it with a chopstick and you can tell if it's going down in there. See, this one's ready for repotting. It only wants to go down about a half inch. I think that was uh, done in 2014. That's how fast they grow. <laughs> okay, sudden oak death. Uh, there's a, a preventive for that, and it's phosphite. Not phosphate, but phosphite. And it's, uh, it also has a fungicide in there, or fungicide. And uh, maybe that's the motto of tomato, I call it fungicide. In here. <laughs> in here. So the uh, distributor is up in Fresno, and the, the owner of the company, I, I have it up here on the uh, source list too, if you want to get some of this. You use a quarter teaspoon to a gallon, and this will prevent sudden oak death. Plus, it's the fastest acting fertilizer known to man or woman. The aerial spray this in the whole Central Valley. This place in Fresno distributes it, and they put it in pretty big jugs. And it has this uh, fungicide that is actually, they can't advertise it, but it's the same fungicide as Subdue. Any of you heard of that? Right now, I'm sure. But anyway, so I don't use any other fungicide, only this. And I do this twice a year. Okay, they, in, in nature, that's uh, sudden oak death has killed hundreds and hundreds of thousands of oak trees. That's really bad stuff. And it's too expensive for them to treat those, but they do have a big hypodermic needle and they bore a hole in the, tr in the tree and they shoot it in there. And that'll prevent it, but it won't make it go away. And the last thing I have is on uh, distressed trees really unhappy trees. So you have one that's all yellow and it's uh, looking really bad. Uh, you can do this any time of year, especially on an oak. Now oaks need extra deep pots because we remove that uh, taproot that goes down there. So if it's in a, a pot that you, you know, the, the, the rule of thumb is if the tree is so big then the pot should be so big, well you've got to go half again on that with an oak tree if you want a happy oak tree. But if you see one getting kind of ugly and tired, <coughs> Howie and I just uh, rescued one that was in ER for a while, but we were looking at this morning, looking good. Looks really good. So you, like, you lift it out of the pot, lightly scratch all over, top, bottom, sides, and uh, root tone it real well. And you put it in a, a large, twice as large a pot for like a training pot. And put it in a wood pot, a bowl pot, any kind of pot you want. Always got plenty of room. And this one that Howie and I worked on was so packed underneath the tree that when when she watered, the water would go down, and the top was so packed and it go off the edge of the pot. So I'm only getting a little moisture around the edge. And I think another month this thing would have been gone. But now it's looking beautiful. So under the bottom where it was so packed, and there's a lot of akadama in there, but it's been a long time. I think it was going on five years. So the best, you don't want to let them go beyond two or three at the max at the repot, if you want it to look really nice. So we took a, uh, a quarter inch drill, put it in the drill motor, and rolled it over, and we put about 40 holes about an uh, inch or two apart quarter inch all the way through, then where we could go all the way through, where there was no tree, we just put all the way through. Soak the tree for an hour or so in a solution of Super Thrive if you like it, or HB 101, and let it get nice and wet, put it back in the pot, use this soil mix, and uh, tie it down real well. And it, we keep it in the shade when we do that to it, to quite a bit of stress, uh, for maybe a couple weeks, or a month at the most, and then full sun. And these guys love full sun because <clears throat> if you keep them in the shade, the leaves really get big. I think it's that way with almost anything because they're searching for light. So you can move things into full sun right away. Even when we uh, defoliate them, you can put it in the full sun after you squirt the cloud cover on it. Okay, any questions? Question of you. How do these trees do with um, air layering? 
I, I've never air layered one. That's the question, do they air layer? I think they would, but uh, I at one time had 65 of them in my yard and I didn't feel like air layering anything. But I tried cuttings, that doesn't work. The best way is acorns. Now you know acorn has this kind of shape like this, like a bomb. So when they fall out of the trees, the heavy end goes down and, and that's the best way to plant them, straight up and down. Just kidding, don't write that down. <laughs> they put them in any old way and, and you put about an inch of uh, soil over the top. Uh, Bob, you want to tell them about these or what's, uh, how are you going to do this? Thank you very much, unless there's another question. She was knitting at the same time she was driving, so a motorcycle officer uh, pulled up alongside her at a red light, and he said, uh, ma'am, pull over. And she said, why no, officer, it's a scarf. <laughs> <laughs> You're real young, I go right over you. <laughs> there was a young man that was talking to his buddies, and they were talking about how they wanted to die. And the uh, young man says, well, when I die, I want to go like my grandfather did, quietly in his sleep, not like all the screaming passengers in his car. <laughs> not too good. <laughs> I got some better ones later. Well, this woman, uh, her name was Mildred, and she was having a heart attack. So she was in ER and her heart stopped. And she had this out of body experience. And she was looking down at her body and she saw this bright light off to the side. And she said, Oh, God, is that you? This is I. She said, Well, please let me go back. I got a lot of things I'd like to do. Oh, all right. And she says, By the way, how much time do I have left on earth? 43 more here. <coughs> so she got back home and she's all healed up and she says, you know, I better get myself looking really good. So she went to the to the uh, plastic surgeon and she had a nose job and a chin job and liposuction and implants and all of those good things. She says, oh, I'm looking really good now. So. She said, one last thing, I have to get my hair done. So she went to the, to the hairdresser and she came out of the hairdresser and she's walking across the street and a bus came along, killed her. And she goes to heaven and she sees God and she says, God, you told me I had 43 more years. And he said, oh, sorry, Mildred, I didn't recognize you. <laughs>